Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gellman, for the for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you also for chairing the seminar and for hosting me here at the Alexandria Institute, which is an absolutely fantastic place to be. So thank you very much. I would also like to start by thanking you all for being here today because I understand that you are very busy people and I also understand the summer vacations are coming up. So I, uh, you have probably some uh, stuff to finish. So I think it's really great that there are so many people here today for the seminar. And um, I would like to sort of preface my uh, presentation by saying just a few words about myself or rather about my work because uh, I'm actually not a, a hardcore Russia specialist, which perhaps is a dangerous thing to say in this environment. So um, much of my work takes place in the sort of intersection between on the one hand international relations theory and the other hand Russian foreign policy studies. So what I usually do in my work is that I ask uh, whether and to what extent these sometimes very big and clunky IR theories can actually help us to understand and to make better sense of Russia's foreign policy and, and, and its international activities. But at the same time also ask so the other question, namely uh, what we actually can learn from Russian foreign policy for more general um, approaches and theories. So to what, so how can we use our expertise on Russian foreign policy to upgrade or modify or adjust mainstream theories? So you could say I really work in this broader area between international relations and Russian foreign policy studies. Now, uh, I had a, a good colleague of mine in Denmark uh, once told me that uh, much of the really interesting stuff goes, up, uh, goes on in these border areas, and this is true for real life and for academia. Uh, but he also said that border areas can be extremely dangerous because if things go wrong, as they sometimes do, you get shot at from both sides, right? And I think that's also very true for real life and for academia. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say here is uh, don't be too tough on me, right? Um, okay, um, so um, I'm going to talk today about Russia's neighborhood policy. And as Professor Gellman said, this is sort of part of an ongoing and a larger project, and I look very much forward to your, to your comments and suggestions and questions uh, later on. Um, now, um, it's very important, I think, from the beginning to, to define what I mean by Russia's neighborhood policy because obviously Finland is Russia's neighbor, right? And China is Russia's neighbor. I think the United States is probably also Russia's neighbor if you take Alaska into account, uh, you could say. Um, and, but what I mean really by Russia's neighborhood policy is Russia's actions and activities in the former Soviet space, right? And I use the terms Russia's neighborhood policy, Russia's near abroad policy, Russia's activities in the former Soviet space. I use them interchangeably and I use them without any uh, moral or normative connotations. I just use them sort of as an umbrella term to describe Russia's actions and activities towards the 14 other former Soviet um, republics. Now, um, it's probably no secret that Russia's neighborhood policy has become quite a, a hotly debated topic, you could say, both in mainstream media but also in, uh, in, the, in academia and not least after the crisis in Ukraine. And if you look at the existing literature, you will find actually there are lots of case studies on sort of individual events and episodes. So lots of studies on the Ukraine crisis. There are lots of studies, I think, on the war in Georgia, and so on and so forth. So what I'll try to do in my uh, presentation or my, my project is slightly uh, is related but slightly different. I try to explain sort of the development or evolution of Russia's neighborhood policy from the early 1990s uh, up until today, or 2018 to be more precise. So if you want to put it in political science language, you could say it's a longitudinal analysis, or sort of a macro analysis, you could say. And in order to carry out this macro analysis, I uh, sort of draw on different realist theories and combine them into a model that I call regional dominance realism, and hence the title of my presentation uh, today. Now, uh, you may ask yourself, so why, why realist theories? Well, uh, that is because, to the best of my knowledge, there exists no uh, study that applies realist theories to shed light on Russia's neighbor, on the evolution of Russia's neighborhood policy or the broader pattern. Um, in fact, and I will say later more about that, in fact, I would argue that sort of the dominant, the predominant explanations of Russia's neighborhood policy that you find in the literature very much focus on so-called unit-level factors, uh, be it uh, decision-maker dynamics in the Kremlin, be it domestic political developments and factors, for example, that Russia has become an increasingly authoritarian state in recent years, 
or also ideational factors like uh, Russia's national identity, its strategic culture, its history, and so on and so forth. Um, so in contrast to these studies, I focus on, on, on realism and try to explore whether and to what extent realist theories can help us to understand the broader pattern of Russia's policy in the post-Soviet space. So that's sort of the purpose of this, um, uh, of this project and uh, my presentation today. Yes. Mm. So, the first question is, of course, how has uh, Russia's neighborhood policy evolved over the last 25 years or so? Now, obviously, if you look at such a long time stretch, you will find there are many zigs and zags, there are many sort of peculiar episodes and sort of uh, spe 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 specific events and so on and so forth. I would nonetheless argue, I would nonetheless argue that uh, when you take a bird's eye perspective, that you can sort of distinguish between two broad periods, really. Uh, and the first period runs from the early 1990s up until sort of the mid-2000s. And in that phase, in that period, you can see that there's a broad consensus emerging. There's a broad consensus emerging among many Russian policymakers that the post-Soviet space should be a Russian sphere of influence, or a Russian uh, sphere of, or a zone of control. And, um, um, and it's very important to underline here that this, this consensus starts to emerge already in the early 1990s, in the early to mid-1990s. And if you go back, you can find really an endless number of quotes and statements and pronouncements by policymakers. And I've just picked here a, a few to make my case, sort of for illustrative uh, purposes. And I have one that is very famous, it's by Yevgeny Ambatumov, who was, I think, the, the, the head of the of Duma's uh, Foreign Affairs Committee at the time, and he said, as you read on the screen, he said that as the internationally recognized legal successor to the USSR, the Russian Federation's foreign policy must be based on doctrine that proclaims the entire geopolitical space of the former Soviet Union the sphere of its vital interests. Then I have another quote by um, Andranik Vigdanyan, who was a close advisor at that time to Yeltsin. I think today he's sort of a mainstream commentator. But, uh, at that time, he was an advisor to Yeltsin, and he said, as you can read on the screen, uh, the entire geopolitical space of the former Soviet Union is or should be a sphere of Russia's vital interests. And actually, the same point was also made by President Yeltsin, both publicly and also privately. Um, so, for example, very interestingly, uh, recently, the, the transcripts of conversations between uh, President Yeltsin and President Clinton, uh, they have been published now by the, by the Clinton Library in the States. And if you go over these transcripts, it's really stunning, it's really striking how outspoken actually Yeltsin himself is about the fact that he wants to maintain the former Soviet Union or the former Soviet, uh, the former Soviet Union as a sphere of Russian influence and control. And just again, for illustrative purposes, I've picked uh, one statement here, which is from the Helsinki summit, which was in March 97, if I'm not mistaken. And you can see that Yeltsin is really it's, it, it's about NATO enlargement, and Yeltsin is sort of recognizing that he probably cannot stop NATO to enlarge into Central Europe, but he wants to make sure that uh, NATO should not expand into the former Soviet space, including the Baltic states. And then at the end of the meeting, uh, he actually proposes to Clinton that uh, one thing, uh, where is this here? regarding the countries of the former Soviet Union, let us have a verbal gentleman's agreement. We would not write it down in a statement that no former Soviet republics would enter, enter NATO. Um, now, uh, Clinton politely but uh, decisively rejected this proposition. Um, but the point here is that there was this broad consensus in the political elite um, already in the early to mid 1990s that one wanted to maintain control over the former Soviet area. And it's also important to underline and to stress here that this was really a broad consensus to united people from very different ideological and political colorations and leanings and, and, and views. So obviously you had sort of the conservative hardliners, the nationalists, that's perhaps not surprising. But again, there are also sort of centrist politicians and also more liberal to the Western leaning politicians like President Yeltsin or also his foreign minister, Andrei Kosyev. They made a number of statements along uh, very similar uh, lines. Now the big question is of course why? Um, what were the reasons for this broad consensus? Now if you go by a, by a realist perspective, that's actually uh, not very difficult to explain. Because there's a strand of realist theory, uh, which is called offensive realism, and this strand tells us that major powers in general and as a rule have strong incentives 
to establish a sphere of influence around their borders and to pursue what is called regional hegemony or regional predominance. Uh, and the reason for this is actually quite simple. The reason is that a major power wants to prevent smaller neighboring countries from teaming up or joining forces with outside great powers. Because, so the argument goes, that no country in the world wants to have bases or airfields or radar sites or other military facilities, or in general a client state of a potential adversary on its border on its doorstep. And therefore, great powers in general and as a rule have a strong incentive to control the foreign and security policy, the foreign and security policy of neighboring states. That is sort of the realist argument in a nutshell. And this realist argument fits actually quite nicely, and fits quite nicely actually with the, with the rhetoric of Russian policymakers. Because as I just said, Russian policymakers are very clear that they want to prevent other former Soviet countries from teaming up with outside great powers. So be it the United States slash NATO, be it the Chinese, or also regional powers like Turkey or Iran. So that's in the 1990s. So the rhetoric on the rhetorical level. What happens in the 1990s? Well, in the 1990s, uh, relatively li little actually happens on the ground, which is to say that this tough and sometimes assertive, sometimes even aggressive rhetoric is not really matched by action. So the question then of course becomes, um, how can you explain, or I should say this is actually quite surprising, because especially in the mid-1990s, uh, outside great powers, for example, NATO not only enlarges into Central Europe, but also, of course, starts to establish closer political ties with former Soviet countries, uh, in particular the Baltic states, but also Ukraine. At the same time, you also see in the 1990s that so the regional powers, especially Turkey, they also make inroads into the former Soviet area. I think it's in 97 and 98 when Turkey signs a number of military treaties and agreements with both Georgia and Azerbaijan. And Russian policymakers, indeed, they look with great concern at these developments and they threaten to take all kinds of countermeasures, from economic sanctions to sort of diplomatic means and instruments, but also military actions. But again, on the ground, very relatively little happens. Okay? And this, of course, brings now up the question, how can you explain this gap or this disconnect between a relatively tough rhetoric on the one hand and relatively little action on the other hand. Now, uh, many scholars have tried to explain this by the fact uh, that Russia was a relatively weak state in terms of economic but also military cap capacities or capabilities at that time. I mean, there's no secret that uh, Russia's economy in the 1990s was basically in free fall. Also, Russia's military was uh, in many ways uh, in shatters. Um, so, therefore, the argument goes Russia could not pursue a more assertive and aggressive policy. Now, the problem with that argument is, of course, that, uh, as, as international relations scholars always say, that power is relative. And if you look at the relative distribution of power capabilities as measured by economic and military capacities, it's pretty clear that even in the 1990s, Russia towers like a giant over the other former Soviet states. There's no question about that. So I would argue, and here I draw on the second strand of realist theory, which is called neoclassical realism, so I would argue that a factor of equal importance, if not greater importance, was the weakness of the Russian state as an institution uh, at the time. For example, for example, uh, the Russian state had great problems and to extract taxes at the time, or so to collect revenues from society. And I have here a slide uh, which shows you the um, the tax, the federal tax revenues relative to the total GDP of uh, of Russia. And you can see here on the slide that um, uh, you can see here that it declined from 1992 is approximately 20 percent. I think it goes down in 1998 to around I think it's 8.5 percent is the precise number. Um, and at the same time, you should keep in mind that Russia's economy as a whole also contracts over the same period, right? So also sort of the cake or the pie from which the Russian state can extract resources also gets significantly smaller. So the point here is that the, sort of the, the amount of money that the Russian state can extract from society in the 1990s is, is low and is decreasing over time. And this, of course, means that there are relatively little funds available to fund 
or finance major policy programs, including foreign policy programs in the former Soviet space. It also means that there's relatively little money available to modernize or upgrade Russia's armed forces. And this also, of course, uh, is, a, is a hindrance for, for an assertive and aggressive neighborhood policy. Mm. But that is not all. In addition to that, we have also some of the so-called oligarchs. They you know, become increasingly wealthy in the mid-1990s. They become also increasingly so influential in the political sphere, and they try to influence uh, political decisions, domestic legislation, to, to advance their own private, very often commercial interests. But to some extent, they also try to influence uh, foreign policy, including Russia's neighborhood policy. Uh, a case in point would be, uh, would be Boris Berezovsky, who, who was a member of, became a member of Russia's National Security Council, and afterwards, I think, yeah, afterwards he became the General Secretary of the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States. Now, as General Secretary of the CIS, Berezovsky was not so much concerned, actually, with advancing the interests of, of Russia, or advancing the interests of this regional organization. He was mainly concerned with facilitating the construction of energy pipelines in the former Soviet region, and mainly to advance the interest of Sipnet, which was by accident his own uh, energy company, right? So this also undermined Russia's ability to pursue a coherent policy. Um, yes. Yes. In addition to that, there were also regional strongmen within Russia, and republics and, and, and regions, but also institutions that sometimes so put in cahoots with or in cooperation and collaboration with some of the oligarchs began to pursue their own semi-independent neighborhood policies. So we could have actually a situation where the uh, Russian foreign ministry would come out and say that Russia is not going to sign, to sign this or that agreement on the division of the Caspian Sea, for example. So Russia is not going to sign this agreement. And two days later, uh, Russia's um, defense ministry would come out and say, yes, Russia is going to sign this agreement. And three days later, Russia's uh, ministry for economic affairs would come out and say, yes, Russia is going to sign this agreement, most likely, but under the conditions A, B, and C. So the point here is that the Russian state was really speaking the different voices. There was a lot of confusion and chaos within Russia, and that also spilled over or was reflected in its neighborhood policy. But uh, things then started to change, of course, in the mid-2000s. Because almost all, nearly all experts or so scholars agree that in the mid-2000s, Russia began to pursue more assertive neighborhood policy. Obviously, it's difficult to pinpoint an exact date or say, like, you know, but around to, by 2004, 2005, Russia became more uh, assertive and began to pursue more coercive and combative policy in the former Soviet region. So how can one explain this? That is, of course, the question. Mm. And here, many observers say that this is something to do with Russia's economic recovery at the time, which was largely, not, not only, of course, but to a large extent fueled by the rise in, in oil and uh, natural gas prices. And the argument goes then, Russia becomes more powerful, uh, has more resources available, and then becomes more assertive and aggressive, which is sort of a very classical I argument. The more powerful you get, the more assertive and expansionist you get. Now, the problem with that argument is, of course, once again, that power is relative, and many of the other former Soviet countries, they also benefited, benefited immensely from this upswing in oil and energy prices, uh, either directly or indirectly. So if you look again at the relative distribution of power, you will, or the relative balance of power, and compare it to the 1990s, you will see that the relative balance of power basically does not change significantly. So there was a power gap in the 1990s, there's a power gap in the 2000s, but there's no sort of significant change. Basically, the balance of power remains the same. So I would again argue that the factor of equal and greater importance is the strengthening of Russian state capacity at the time. And for example, the Putin government manages in a, in a time span of a few years, actually, to strengthen the extraction capacity of the Russian state. That, may, that means it becomes now the uh, state becomes more capable to extract taxes from society. And I should have another slide on that. Yeah. So you can see here that tax extraction 98 to low point at 8.5% and increases to about 24% in 2007. And that of course means 
that there are more uh, resources, more uh, more financial uh, um, assets that are available to um, for, 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 for policy purposes in general, including foreign policy uh, purposes. For example, now you can fund and finance major policy programs in the post red space. There's also more money available uh, for the modernization of the Russian uh, military. And that, of course, also, I know it's a complex story, the modernization of the Russian military, but I think the, the, the available financial resources is one of the basic uh, factors that enables the uh, upgrading and uh, modernization of Russia's armed forces, which again makes it then easier or, or it's easier uh, for Russia to pursue a more assertive neighborhood uh, policy. Yes. Um, in addition to that, what the Putin government also manages to do is that they sort of rein in the so called oligarchs, or at least those oligarchs uh, that they are not loyal to the Kremlin. So, a case in point would be the aforementioned Boris Berezovsky. I think of the, the paradigmatic example here is probably Mikhail Khodorkovsky and his Energy Empire Yukos. And I think there are many here in the room that probably know much more about this story uh, than I do. But, but the point here is that sort of the Putin government, the Kremlin, manages to rein in these oligarchs, but also they can now use these oligarchs and their big energy uh, empires or, or corporations and companies for foreign policy purposes. Uh, so I think it's in the mid-2000s when many of these Russian energy uh, corporations, they go on a shopping spree, on a shopping tour, uh, both, uh, I should say, both state-owned companies, but also private companies. They go on a shopping tour and they acquire um, energy assets and infrastructure in the other former Soviet republics. And again, there's a, a debate among some scholars whether or not this was driven by commercial interest or by strategic interest. Well, probably so the truth is somewhere in the middle that it was, to some extent, beneficial for commercial uh, uh, interest, but I think it was also uh, advantageous for, for strategic interest because, you know, with control of energy assets, you also get normally some form of political clout and uh, influence. So you could say that sort of the balance of power or the balance of influence between oligarchs and the Russian state had shifted, whereas in the 1990s it was sort of the oligarchs and the private actors, societal actors, that could hijack state institutions and use them to advance their own private interests. Now the situation was the exact opposite, and the state, to some extent at least, the state could use uh, private actors, private corporations, to pursue or advance the interests of the state. And uh, just so as a side note, uh, I recently uh, uh, came across a read a book by uh, Mike Galliotti, Mark Galliotti, on the Divori, on the Russia's uh, organized crime. Uh, syndicates and organizations, and he makes actually a very similar argument, you could say, namely that in the 1990s it was basically the crime organizations that were running a rough shot over the Russian state, whereas in recent years there are some indications, and he provides some sort of circumstantial evidence, that it's sometimes actually the Russian state who can use these criminal organizations to advance its interests, its foreign policy interests, uh, especially in the former uh, Soviet space. Uh, so, to make a long story short, the point here is that the strengthening of the Russian state is, in my view, a very, very important factor. It's a very important factor because it enables Russia to pursue a more coherent and a more combative foreign policy in general and a more uh, coherent and combative neighborhood policy uh, in particular. Now, and that is the situation since the mid-2000s. Now, with that being said, it's also clear that Russia's neighborhood policy since the mid-2000s has not been sort of a constant. You have also some variation there. So in some cases, in some countries, Russia has pursued highly coercive policies, whereas in other cases, and towards other countries, Russia has pursued you know, a more cooperative approach, you could say. So the question now becomes, of course, how can you explain this variation uh, towards different countries and in different situations? And in order to explain this variation, I draw on the third strand of realist theory, which is called defensive realism, and argue that the level of external pressure, that the level of external pressure is a very important factor to explain this variation in Russia's neighborhood policy. And then, um, uh, more specifically, I argue or I distinguish between three levels of external pressure, high, low, and moderate, uh, and argue that these different levels lead to different types of neighborhood policy, okay? And my, my basic argument is actually really simple. 
Uh, my basic argument would be that the level of external pressure is low if another former Soviet country makes it clear that there's no intentions, there's no ambitions to team up with an outside uh, power. And in these situations, I argue, Russia will provide economic, diplomatic, and if need be, also military assistance to the country. Uh, and the purpose of these support policies is, of course, to reward compliant behavior, uh, but also uh, to prop up and protect the government of that country against internal rivals. Because, you know, if internal rivals come to power, if another government or another regime comes to power, they might have other ideas about, well, their foreign policy orientation, and they might have other plans. So support policies if another former Soviet country basically has no ambition to team up with outside powers. And I think uh, sort of a nice example of that would be Russia's uh, policy or Russia's approach towards Ukraine under Yanukovych. I think to some extent you also can argue, although that's a more tricky case, and I'm currently looking into that, is Russia's policy towards Belarus. And I think to some extent you could also argue that support policies are the main feature of Russia's policies or Russia's approach towards Armenia. Then there's a second kind of situations, uh, situations when the level of external pressure is moderate. And by moderate external pressure, I mean a situation where another former Soviet country makes it very clear that it has ambitions to team up or join forces with an outside power. And the outside power also indicates some sort of willingness <coughs> that yes, we, would, we are willing to enter in some sort of security partnership uh, with that specific country. Now, in these kinds of situations, I argue that Russia will uh, pursue or adopt a more coercive approach or coercive policies, which can include various forms of diplomatic pressure, which can include uh, economic sanctions, uh, trade embargoes, and so on and so forth. And if there's a situation where a neighboring, another former Soviet country is on the brink, is on the verge of entering into a full-fledged security partnership with an outside great power, an outside power, I argued Russia even will use the threat and use of military force. So simply put, you could say that the closer the political-military relations between an outside great power and another former Soviet countries, the more assertive, the more coercive will Russia's policy be towards that country. And I think here, as an almost paradigmatic example, would be Russia's approach towards, uh, towards Georgia. And I can say more about that later on in the Q&A, um, if you want to. And there's a third type of situations, namely when the level of external pressure is high. And by high level of external pressure, I mean a situation where a post-Soviet country has actually managed to establish a security partnership with an outside power. And in these kinds of situations, I actually argue that Russia will abstain or refrain from using military force against that country. Why is that? Well, that is because it's extremely dangerous and actually risky to use military force against a foreign line small state because, you know, you may end up in a major conflict or perhaps even a shooting war with another great power, which again, is, is it's rather dangerous, especially in the nuclear age. So if another former Soviet country has established a close security partnership with an outside power, I actually argue that Russia will abstain from using military force. This does not mean, however, that Russia will simply um, sit on its hands on, and, and do nothing. Instead, Russia will, will adopt what I call uh, subversive policies. And by subversive policies, I mean things that, you know, they will sort of provide support to perhaps restive minorities, to domestic opposition groups. They will try to foment unrest and instability in the country. And the aim of these uh, subversive policies of, is, of course, to keep this foreign-aligned small state, to keep it weak, to keep it, to keep it divided, and to keep it off balance to the extent and uh, to the extent possible. And here I would argue that, again, a very obvious example would be Russia's approach towards the Baltic states, because you all know probably that since the mid-2000s, Russia has used all kinds of means and instruments to destabilize and weaken the Baltic states from within. At the same time, however, and despite a lot of military posturing, no doubt about that, a lot of military posturing, at the same time, Russia has re re refused or abstained from using open or direct military force against any of the three Baltic states. And why is that? Well, my argument would be, and this is not really a new or innovative argument, this is to do with the simple fact that the Baltic states, they managed to become NATO members in the early 2000s, 
at a time of Russian state weakness, as I explained earlier. So in, my, in the language of my theory, I would say that the level of external pressure is high, but the level of pressure is so high that Russia actually abstains from using military force because, again, there are the risks that, that, would, that they would end up in a major conflict with NATO or perhaps even a shooting war, which uh, I think uh, is not in Moscow's uh, interest. Um, okay, so my overall argument here would be that, well, uh, it seems to be the case that Russia's uh, neighborhood policy is determined, not completely, but to a large extent by varying levels of external pressure. I should also just sort of add here that I do not mean to imply that all Russian actions over the last 25 years can be explained uh, by external pressure. That's of course crazy, that's of course nonsense. I just mean that external pressure is a very important or a significant factor that sort of affects the type or the style or the strategy that Russia adopts towards neighboring uh, countries. And my sort of broader point would be that you actually get quite a long way, again, you will not be able to explain 100% of Russia's neighborhood policy, but you get quite a long way to explain Moscow's behavior when you combine different uh, realist theories. That would be sort of my, uh, my conclusion. I'm not done yet. No, I'm not done yet. <laughs> I still have like 10 minutes to go. Because now I'm sure that there are some of you sitting here thinking, well, that, that's fine. There's some sort of superficial correlation, perhaps, between realist theory uh, and, and Russia's neighborhood policy. But is it then re is it re really realistic to treat Russia as a unitary actor? And aren't there other factors? Aren't there other factors and other approaches? that provide a much more convincing and compelling account for Russia's behavior and actions. So what I want to do actually in the last uh, 10 minutes of my presentation, 12 minutes, is that I want to sort of look briefly at some alternative explanations that you find in the literature, okay? And in my view actually, there, are, as I indicated in the beginning, there's sort of three, I would say, almost dominating explanations that you find in the literature. And the first one is what I call uh, the little <coughs> Mr. Putin argument. And, and the argument here is, of course, that Russia's near abroad assertiveness can be directly, almost direct, or directly traced to the, uh, to the worldviews, to the character traits, to the ideas, to the perceptions, and to the career background of, of uh, President Putin. Because, you know, Putin is an old KGB agent, and, you know, he has been socialized during the Cold War, so he has this Cold War mindset, which means that he's extremely suspicious about everything that the West does, and he has this ambition to, to rebuild or reestablish the Soviet Empire on the territory of the former Soviet, well, of the former Union, and so on and so forth. And so that is one uh, explanation that you find, uh, of course, I'm simply finding here, I'm cutting corners, but I, I guess you, you, you get the, the gist of the argument. And that's one argument that is quite popular, of course, in the mainstream media, but are there also a number of scholars who just subscribe to this kind uh, of argument. And now, I think there is no doubt that Putin obviously plays a very central role in Russia's political structure today. I think there's also hardly any doubt that Russia is a quite ambitious man and he's a very powerful, powerful and influential man. I think there's no doubt about that. I still would argue that if you reduce it only, or let's say mainly to President Putin and his worldviews, I think you will have a hard time really explaining sort of the pattern of Russia's neighborhood policy. And I have sort of two points that I want to want to emphasize here. Uh, the first would be very obviously the first very obvious point. This Putin-centered approach cannot explain why we already in the early early to mid 1990s see this broad-based consensus emerging in the Russian elite that one wants to control uh, the former Soviet space. Um, because at that time, you know, I think Putin, he just had returned from Dresden to St. Peters St. Petersburg, was working under Sobchak, uh, I guess. Um, but I think it's certain to say that he had hardly any or no influence on the foreign policy making or the foreign policy concepts and ideas that were developed at that time in the Kremlin. So that's, of course, you cannot really explain that, obviously, with a, with a Putin-centered approach. Uh, second, a more specific point would be that if, if you go back to the year 1999 or 2000, when Putin came into power, and so if you can time travel and you go back to that time, and you look sort of at potential competitors, let's say, not competitors, alternatives to Putin who could also come into power, and we look at their foreign policy programs and ideas, well, surprise, surprise, all of them 
had very different ideas in many respects, but in one respect they were very similar, namely that they also wanted to sort of establish a sphere of influence on the former Soviet territory. So in my reading there are sort of four, four potential alternatives. Uh, one was uh, Primakov, the former foreign minister and, and the prime minister. And the second, perhaps not really an alternative to Putin, but or not a realistic candidate, but still a very influential politician, so Zyuganov, the head of the Communist Party. A third one was, of course, uh, General Alexander Levitt, who was, I think, a very powerful figure at that time. And last but not least, we had, a, of course, also uh, the powerful mayor of Moscow, Lushkov. And again, if you go back and read what they say about foreign policy, they say different things about foreign policy, but when it comes to na the neighborhood policy, again, there's a broad agreement uh, between and among these four figures, which more or less is the same position that eventually uh, Putin adopted. So my argument would be, if any of these four figures had come to power instead of Putin, we can make the hypothetical argument that Russia's neighborhood policy would not have been significantly uh, different. Um, so I guess also we can sort of test this argument in the future that uh, if Putin is ran over by a car tomorrow, or if he eventually steps down and a person, a personality, or a president with a very different personality, with very different worldviews comes into power, well, if this theory, if this argument is correct, we should see that Russia's neighborhood policy will change substantially. If not, I think uh, this argument has, uh, has, some, has some problems. Uh, okay, that's uh, one alternative argument. Uh, then there's a second group of scholars who say, so maybe it's not really so much about Putin in and of himself, but maybe it's more to do with Russia's political structures today, and especially with the fact that Russia has become increasingly authoritarian, autocratic, semi-authoritarian, you can well, call it what you want, uh, state. Uh, and the argument here is that authoritarian or semi-authoritarian governments and regimes today have a tendency to pursue an especially assertive and aggressive foreign policy. So in a way you could say it's the flip side argument of the democratic peace theory, which you might have heard about, that well, democracies are, are peaceful, especially uh, towards each other. So the argument here is that authoritarian governments are especially assertive. But what is the underlying logic behind this argument? Well, um, the underlying logic behind this argument is that authoritarian regimes, they lack what political scientists scientists call input legitimacy because you know there are no free and fair elections so that the selection of the leadership in and of itself does not generate legitimacy but still authoritarian regimes rely on some sources of legitimacy for example output legitimacy that means that the policies sort of generate wealth and welfare for large parts or large segments of the population this in a sense will also generate support for and legitim and generate some sort of legitimacy of, of for the government um, the problem is, of course, that if and when the economy slows down, or if there's a major financial or economic crisis, this will sort of eat away the support for and legitimacy of the government. So what do authoritarian governments do in these kinds of situations? Well, the argument goes that they use an old trick, and they start to sort of create external crises. They start to engage in foreign policy adventures, because that will sort of uh, will unite the people behind the government and it will also distract the attention of the people or the population from these internal economic and political failures. And there are quite a number of scholars who make actually exactly this argument when it comes to Russia's neighborhood policy that say, who, who argue that, well, uh, economically, politically, well, things are not going well within Russia, so what does the Putin government do? Well, it creates these external crises to distract attention, the Russian uh, population's attention from internal failures, generate the nationalism and so on and so forth. And I think it's intuitively extremely appealing, this argument, and I think there is probably also some, uh, some truth in this argument. I would nevertheless also say that this argument has some, some challenges or some, some potential weak spots. Uh, one potential weak spot would be a timing uh, problem. Because as I told you earlier, almost all scholars agree that it was in the mid-2000s that Russia became increasingly assertive in the former Soviet area. Now, I also told you that it was in the mid-2000s that the economy was doing actually really well, right? But this all, the economy was doing really well, and also large segments of the Russian population, at least in the major cities, were doing relatively well. Like, we had this emerging middle layer in Russia, you know, families could buy a new TV set, a microwave, perhaps even a new car. So, and not surprisingly, as a result of this, well, the, there was a large uh, general support for the regime. So the, the approval ratings of the government were, were, were quite high. 
At the same time, however, the Russian government started to become increasingly assertive on the international stage, which in a way is exactly the opposite uh, prediction that this regime security argument makes. Because this regime security argument makes that, well, you should be especially aggressive externally if you have internal problems. But here you see that things in ex internally, domestically, were going pretty well. Still, Russia adopted an increasingly assertive uh, policy. So that is sort of some timing problem, I would say. And there is a second sort of war abstract, perhaps a little, more, a little bit more theoretical point here. And that is that um, this argument is also known in IR as diversionary war theory. And this diversionary war theory was quite popular among many scholars for, for many, many years. In recent years, however, some scholars have sort of started to criticize the argument because they say that the underlying logic behind this argument does not really hold, uh, hold water. And, and they say that the and the reason for this is that research shows that if you create these external crises, you engage in foreign policy adventures, yeah, that will sort of produce a spike in support for the government, but this sort of, um, this, this uh, support for the government will evaporate or will sort of go back to the previous level after three to four months. That was the research shows. After three to four months, you go back to normal. And now, to make matters even worse from a regime security perspective, in the mid or long run, you may even sort of decrease the support for the government because, you know, if you engage in these long drawn out wars, it's usually not very popular among large parts of the population. Uh, not least because this is, among other things, because this has, you know, uh, it costs uh, blood and treasure, right? So there are also indirect financial costs involved very often in these good conflicts. Think of economic sanctions. And again, very often large parts of the population have to bear the brunt of these uh, economic consequences. So the argument here is that, logically at least, if you engage in foreign policy advantages and start all kinds of wars, in the, in the midterm, the regime, the government, is actually shooting itself in the foot. So that's why many scholars today argue that if we assume, if we assume that authoritarian governments are somewhat rational actors or strategic players, which I think very often you can make a good, argue, good case that they are, well, it makes just the logic behind this argument makes really, sense, makes really a little sense. I'm not sure if I've expressed myself here totally clear, but the point is that there are some empirical problems for this argument, but also uh, some uh, problems with the underlying theoretical logic of this, of this approach. Then, last but not least, in my final slide, I'm almost done. Last but not least, there's a third group of scholars who say, maybe it's not so much actually Russia's domestic political structures that really sort of drive the train and are the key, key driving force here, but maybe it has more to do with ideational factors. And by, <clears throat> and by ideational factors, scholars mean, mean things like Russia's national identity, its strategic culture, also sort of its history that sort of manifests itself in, in the different discourses and narratives, and so on and so forth. So one common argument is, for example, that Russia has this uh, great power identity, and it's part and parcel of this great power identity, at least in the, sort of the Russian narrative, that you have to have a sphere of influence, in a way it's sort of a symbol or a status marker of being a great power. You have to sort of control your geographic neighborhood. Uh, and, well, that's why the Russians pursue an assertive neighborhood, uh, an assertive policy towards uh, the neighboring states. Also, of course, history plays a role in being for, 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 for centuries sort of part of the Tsarist Empire or the Soviet Union, so in a way, large parts of the Russian elite, but perhaps also the Russian population, have never really accepted that these other countries are fully sovereign and independent states, so it's still sort of continue to meddle and interfere these countries just sort of for, for historical reasons. And again, I think it's, it's it, it's really hard to argue against these arguments. I think undoubtedly sort of ide ideational factors do play a role. But I would also sort of like to highlight two weak spots or challenges for these kinds of uh, arguments. Uh, first weak spot, perhaps, of these arguments is that um, identities can and do change over time, right? Identities can and do change over time, but they usually do not change very fast. And so, I mean, a society or a country does not change an identity like people change their clothes in the morning. So it's a slow-moving factor. And since identity is such a slow-moving factor, it might be difficult to explain sort of shorter variations over time and across space. For example, if and when, let's assume that Russia has this 
great power, however defined great power identity, and that it wants to establish a sphere of influence, then the question becomes, of course, okay, so why did they not pursue a more assertive, a more aggressive policy already in the early 1990s or the mid 1990s? Well, as I alluded to earlier, I think that resource factors, but especially though the state capacity factor, which is partly institutional, partly material factor, plays a very important role here. So I think a purely ideational argument cannot explain this variation of this development over time. That would be one potential weak spot. Uh, then a second potential weak spot would uh, have to do with the fact that constructivist scholars have driven home the point that uh, countries or societies usually do not have one identity. There are usually sort of se several identities that are in, exist uh, at the same time, and sometimes or very often they compete with each other so on a discursive level. And that is exactly the argument that many uh, many scholars make when it comes to Russian policy. So the, the standard standard scholarly account of the early 1990s is that we had a more a Western discourse of identity strand, Atlantis discourse identity strand, then we had a more conservative nationalist identity strand, and we had then the centrist identity strand. And the, these were sort of ideas that are competing on a discursive level, and at the end of the day, in the mid-90s, the centrist identity strand won out. And part of the centrist identity strand is exactly that you have great power identity that you want to control your neighborhood and so on and so forth. So I think that can nicely explain, or to some extent explain, uh, uh, Russia's approach towards the other former Soviet countries. Now, for me, this, this, this argument, however, begs the question, so why was it exactly that this centrist identity strand won out? So why was it not the westernizing, the Atlanticist identity discourse that became dominant? Why was it not the conservative nationalist discourse that, that became dominant? So, in a way, I think it just elevates the question to the next level. Why was it exactly this set, this type of ideas, and not, not, not the other type of ideas that became so influential among policy circles uh, within Moscow or within Russia? Um, so, in a sense, I, and I think many of these constructivist inspired scholars, they do not have provided a fully convincing answer to this question. I'm not saying that it's not possible to give an answer to this question. I'm just saying that, to the best of my knowledge, the existing literature has not really, the constructivist literature has not really fully engaged with that question. Okay, so I think I uh, will uh, stop here, just sort of reiterate my main point. My main point is not to say that all these expla explanations get everything totally wrong and I get everything totally right. Uh, my point would just be that uh, I think that there are, in the existing form, there are some problems with these uh, so far, thus far, dominating approaches. And I think actually you can show that you get really a far, a long way to explain the overall pattern and development of Russia's neighborhood policy when you combine different uh, realist approaches and theory. And I think I'll stop here and say thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you very much.